I think that you can tell you're amongst family. Thank you. You're amongst friends, you're amongst people who love you and admire you and respect you and appreciate the great work that you have done. They never clap that big for me when I come out. Uh, <laughs> I want to get as much out of our time together as we possibly can. There are some things that uh, the video covered that are obvious and a lot of people know about. There are other things that I think that they know less about that I wanted to talk about. When you, our theme today, incidentally, is navigating, leadership navigating through storms. And I want you to realize that you can't be in leadership and not navigate through storms. So if you're afraid of storms, get out of leadership. It's unavoidable, there are going to be storms. And you have had, in 92 years, your fair share of storms, probably somebody else's. I wanted to start, when you start talking about storms between countries, a lot of people don't know this. They know that you have been on the front lines fighting for justice inside the country. But a lot of people don't realize how much work you have done outside the country in settling conflicts. And I think long before we were dealing with the current situation that we're dealing with in Israel, you have been speaking up for a long time for the Palestinians and the people of Israel to come together and work to terms. Can we start there and just, just work our way out? We can, and um, I tell you, in many ways, my public life started there because uh, Ralph Bunch, who <coughs> not enough of us know about, was an African-American kid in Los Angeles, uh, went to UCLA, uh, played basketball uh, and ran track, went to Harvard on a scholarship and uh, ended up at Howard University. Uh, but in 1948, he was one of those who uh, put together a plan that would possibly bring peace to the Middle East. And so his partner, uh, Count Bernadotte, who was the Jewish negotiator, was killed. And only Ralph Bunch was left. And when Ralph Bunch finished putting this two-state solution together, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1948. And I was just going into Howard University. So he has been one of my heroes from the very beginning. Wow. Uh, he stayed around, <coughs> he stayed around the UN until I got there. And um, he was always quiet, maybe even shy. But he was the mind behind the United Nations in many ways. So when you think about people like that and the notion of there being a two-state system, and we've been talking about it since 1948, which I believe is about the time that Israel became a nation. So we've been dealing with this for some time. Are you surprised that we're still having conflict in this area now? No, I'm not surprised because the world has not been stable since 1948. <laughs> and the problems in Israel uh, have not come primarily from the Jews in Israel, but they've been, they've been persecutions of Jews all over the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, there's a significant number of uh, Jews that are my, our color in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, that were driven out of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And e Ethiopia is another story. It's a favorite country of mine, but they cannot get along. <laughs> mm -hmm. And th there's famine and starvation. In fact, there's probably more suffering of brown people in North Africa uh, because of famine and global warming. Uh, than there is in Israel. They're just not on television. Why, why do you think that is? So, okay. We, we've still, you know, let me go back to, uh, do you remember Martin Luther King Sr.? Yes. 
and um, uh, the pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church in New York, uh, mm -hmm. Sandy Ray, mm -hmm. uh, they got together with Martin Luther King Jr. and decided that they had an idea that was going to bring peace to the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. This was 1966. Okay. And I went to Israel and met with the Israeli and the Jordanian tourist boards. Mm -hmm. And because we had done so well in the South, and one of the ways we made Atlanta a big league city is through conventions and tourism, just as you've done here in Dallas. And we figured if we could get 4,000 black folk to go to Israel together and Jordan, half would stay on one side and half would stay on the other side. They were going to build an amphitheater around the Sea of Galilee. Sandy Ray was bringing a hundred boys choir from Brooklyn, and Martin Luther King was going to preach from a boat in the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> and we figured the 4,000 tourists bringing money would also bring peace. Mm -hmm. And I, we called it Hallelujah in the Holy Land. <laughs> And if we had been successful, we were successful in getting people to agree. And we had 4,000 black folk in 1966 that had put up deposits to go. And um, as I was leaving, after all the arrangements and agreements were made, the first Egyptian jets were shot down over Gaza right now where they are now still. And um, we had to cancel that trip. We would have lost a whole lot of money. Uh, and, and in fact, it, it takes a lot of money to put together something like this. So you, you don't but win every battle. One other thing that I put out <laughs> is that Governor Rockefeller went to Sandy Ray. Governor Rockefeller did Governor what? Governor Dave, yeah. No, Governor Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller. Yeah, Nelson. And he said, look, I heard what you and Daddy King were trying to do, and you were on the right side of history. It's not your fault that it didn't work out. Now, you have done what the Lord led you to do. Let me clean it up. My job is handling money. And and he said, I don't want to see your churches suffer. And so he said, let me worry about how to pay off the debts. So we, we've, we haven't been alone in this. The people of goodwill all over the place have realized that we got to find a way to get people, all people together. Mm -hmm. Now for us as black folk, we, we adopted the heritage of Moses. Let my people go. Mm -hmm. When Israel was an Egypt land, let my people go. You know, and uh, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. All of our her heritage and history is uh, from the Old Testament. Right. So I don't think of this as as a race problem, a class problem, a national problem. <laughs> it, 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 it's a human problem that we've got to find a way to deal with. When you, when you mentioned, uh, yeah, this is a good place to start. When you mentioned the unrest in Haiti, and uh, it's been all over our news right now, and also Ethiopia, why do you, why do you think we only learn what we see on TV? And we only believe what we see on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whether we should or not. But that has become our news of choice. And yet our news as a whole does not focus in on uh, Ethiopia and Haiti to the degree that it would, say, uh, some other places like Kiev and other, uh, other places, uh, Ukraine and Russia and other places. Why do you think that is and do you think that's going to change? Well, I think it's got to change. And, you know, freedom is a constant struggle. 
We sing that. We struggle so long that we must be free. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's not just for us as black people. That's for almost all people. All people are in a struggle against poverty. They're in a struggle against famine. They're in a struggle against classism and racism. And there's no place that I've ever been anywhere in the world where everybody gets along and acts like they're brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> Not even in your own family. <laughs> I, I think it is sometimes we have unrealistic expectations about that sort of thing, how that evolves, how that grows. As you all begin to birth the civil rights movement, I have heard you say that you all did not succeed in the civil rights movement without struggle. And not just the KKK, but internal struggles, struggles from within our community, struggles from elsewhere. You had struggles from everywhere, but you kept going. I'm living in a time now that I see leaders who are always complaining because somebody's talking about them or somebody doesn't like them or somebody, somebody's a hater on them. You, you cannot lead today if you're not prepared to navigate through a storm. Can you talk to it? You, 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 you just can't do it. You just can't do it. Uh, if, if you wait for every storm to be over before you celebrate, you'll be dead. You have to celebrate the journey and not the destination. And uh, at least that's my view on it. What, what, what do you talk to us about some of the hurdles that you all had to come over and, and how you managed to do that? What it really means to be a leader in the middle of turbulence? Well, let me just start with 1964 when uh, Martin Luther King won the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. and. He'd been generally respected and loved by everybody. But all of a sudden in 1964, when it was announced that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize, J. Edgar Hoover got furious. And he started talking about everything in the world about Martin, nasty. And he did it in front of a group of white women that he was supposed to be speaking about law enforcement, and he took the whole speech and, and, and trashed Martin Luther King. Now, we were in Bimini writing the Nobel Peace Prize speech, and all of these helicopters came in, and we didn't know what Hoover was talking about. Then we realized that he had been asking members of Congress and the Senate and his friends in government to nominate him for the Nobel Peace Prize. And when he, Martin Luther King got it, he lost it. And he put the whole FBI on us, trying to find some kind of dirt. It had nothing to do with us. It was because he wanted the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and he got angry that this I mean, Martin Luther King was not a big man. He was five feet seven. He was a, a wonderful fella, uh, great personality, loved everybody. And uh, I never heard him say a bad word even about Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yet, all hell broke loose. And do you think? It really didn't end. To, to, until his death. Until his death. Do you and think? And then it didn't end. <clears throat> no, it's still going on today. And, and that, that's the sad part. It's, it's still going on today that he gave his life is still going on today. Do you think that one of the most difficult parts about being a leader when you come up under that kind of attack, that you can't return fire in similar fashion you, you have to hold your peace and, and let them castigate you uh, publicly. I mean, Christ had to do it. Dr. King had to do it. Is that something that we as leaders need to understand that we can't start beefing with everybody that's beefing with us just because they're doing it? Well, you know, I grew up in New Orleans 
with the Nazi party on the corner, 50 yards from where I was born. And my daddy told me when I was four years old that these are white supremacists. Mm -hmm. They think they're better than you and everybody else in the world. Uh, but you've been to Sunday school. And you know that God created a one blood all the nations of the world. He said, now, you got enough on your mind and enough barriers in front of you. You don't have to worry about them. You let God, let them worry, let God worry about them. <laughs> you see? Yeah. And you have to do the best you can do. <laughs> and he said, if you get angry at somebody and lose your temper, you're going to lose the fight. And his message to me from four years old was, don't get mad, get smart. <laughs> see? And he said, you, you, can, you might be able to beat up some people and you can outrun a lot of people. He said, but you won't feel good if you run from a fight. And you won't feel good if you beat up somebody that's easy to beat up. He said, the best thing to do is you take care of your business and you let God deal with them and you let your mind and your heart and your spirit lead you. So that, that's the clapping moment right there. So one of the things that I hear you saying is leaders should not expend undue energy wrestling with people who refuse to be convinced. You really shouldn't. And, and, and I know you and I don't have that problem. <laughs> uh, but, that was funny. <laughs> but, no, but, but what I'm about to say is it doesn't pay for me to even get mad with my wife. <laughs> I mean, she will do some things sometime that, um, that make me extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, see? extremely, extremely <laughs> uncomfortable. That's a good but, word for it. The only thing that happens if I try to do something bad to her is it gets worse. <laughs> See? And so, you know, m m m it's not only your wife and your children and the people you love, but the best way to get along with evil in the world is probably to love the hell out of it. <laughs> because another, another evil is insecurity. <laughs> See? What that, gets, was a, that was worth the ticket to fly down here. Evil what, what, is insecurity. It's insecurity and, and it's jealousy. Yeah. And the people that don't like you want to be like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, they not only want to be like you, they want to be you. <laughs> right, 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 right. I wish I could preach like you. I really do. <laughs> but I don't hate you for it. I admire you for it. <laughs> yeah. if if I manage to do half the things with my life that you have done with yours, I will consider myself victorious. You, you, you have really been a trailblazer and continue to contribute. And I was stuck on this point because at one moment I see you serving Dr. King. The next moment I see you leading the city of Atlanta, creating millions of jobs, opening up economic uh, wealth that it had never experienced before. Most of us are either leaders or, or servers, but you seem to be able to toggle back and forth between the two. How do you do that? I, I don't know. <laughs> you... I was waiting on a real profound statement. 
Now, you know, let the day's own trouble be sufficient unto the day thereof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Consider the lilies of the field. Mm -hmm. They toil not, neither do they spin. Mm -hmm. Yet Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. If God so loves the birds of the air, the flowers of the field, how much more is he going to love you, his children? And you have, to, you have to trust in the Lord. We sing that. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will treat everybody right. I will treat everybody right, no matter how they treat me. I'm going to treat them right till I die. And um, that's been the genius of our people. I think if, you know, I listen at what you said, and I certainly agree with it, and I listen at the cheering responses, and yet I know that some of the people that are cheering are also people that if you sit in their seat or, or they don't lead the song in the choir or they don't get called on to speak at an event, then all of those cheers turn to dust. But in reality, nobody shines all the time. And I think being able to know when you are a great sergeant rather than a poor general <laughs> is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> Doesn't mean that you won't ever be a great general. You went on and became a great general many times over. But with Dr. King, you served and kept the peace. And because of your personality, kept a certain tranquility and an equilibrium that probably otherwise wouldn't be there which means that you had a keen sense of who you were. Well, you know, Dr. King was very helpful to us. You have to remember, he was only 39 when he was killed. And he was stabbed when he was in his 20s by a crazy black woman. Uh, while he was signing, while he, no, while he was signing books, no, it's true in Harlem, and and he she stabbed him with a a letter opener, uh, and he, he had lived he he was walking in a line in front of in Atlanta. He went left Montgomery and went to Atlanta because his parents thought it would be safer. And the first time he got in a demonstration in Atlanta, they took him to uh, Reedsville Penitentiary. And he was put in chains in the back of a paddy wagon and with a, nothing but him and a German shepherd. And there, and there, were, no, uh, there were no expressways then. So he, he was riding on country roads. And I think the only thing that kept him alive was that every time he rolled toward the dog, the dog would get upset and, bow and growl. <laughs> and, but the Lord had prepared him. He grew up with a German shepherd when he was two years old. <laughs> okay. So he was not afraid of the dog. Okay. See, some of us would have had a nervous breakdown just because <laughs> of the dog. See? But he, he spent so much time trying to keep the dog calm that that's the way the Lord used to keep him calm. Mm -hmm. See, in the face of what he thought might be his death before he was 30 years old. So in the middle of every controversy and adverse situation, God has a way of turning it around if you look for it. Uh, that, that, that's a very, very powerful statement. Uh, you, you look at yourself, you look, John Lewis is gone, Fannie Lou Hammer is gone, Hamer is gone, Rosa Parks is gone, uh, Dorothy Hyde is gone, so many of the civil rights leaders that were prevalent when you were a young man and, and you are still here. For a lot of the people in this room, this is things that they read about in books before revisionism. Uh, they might not be in books much longer if we're not careful. 
Uh, do you think that part of your assignment in being here now is to be a living testimony that cannot be erased out of a book of what actually happened along the way? Well, I wish I could say that, but uh, that's a little too egotistical for me. <laughs> and I. Th if, uh, assuming that you weren't joking, that you really are cocky and can be arrogant and can be egotistical, you said, but I've learned. Yeah. Instead of saying, this is how I am and this is the way I've got to be, you were able to learn that sometimes the way you are is not the most effective way to get the most results you need. Well, that's my emotions uh -huh. responding. Right. And everybody gets emotional when they lose control. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, 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 I guess I, I credit my father. My father used to, I mean, he'd slap me around all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'd get upset with him and start swinging, he'd really slap me. <laughs> he says, see, I made you lose your temper. And you lose your temper and you lose your head, <laughs> see? And he said, don't get mad, get smart, see? And there used to be songs when I was growing up in New Orleans, be cool, fool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we have dealt with, we have dealt with ego and egotism all the way back to Cain and Abel. And um, right now, I think, I think it's a global crisis. Mm -hmm. And it, it's gotten to the point now where it's, it's not only influence in our politics, it's influence in politics in South Africa. Right. It's influence in politics in Europe. It's, right. it's what made Putin invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. See, it's wanting to be the biggest and the baddest, if not the best. See? So, so who do you, maybe there's nobody to blame, but who do you blame since it is global? And I'm so glad to hear you say that most people who live between California and, and New York don't think beyond America. The problems that are going on in America are going on in Namibia. They're going on in South Africa. They're going on in Russia. They're going on all over the world. We will find somebody to hate. They're blonde haired. They're short. They're tall. They're fat. We'll find somebody to castigate. Why do you think, it seems like to me, I don't know that it's true, it seems like to me it's worse than ever. Now, now it, it might, it might well, not it be. Well, it is. It's worse, isn't it? It is, but the reason, it may not be worse than ever, but now we got to look at it all day long, every day, mm -hmm. on some kind of computer or television, and we don't get a break from it. See, and, we, they used to tell us in, in the movement, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. If you're bleeding, you're going to be on the front page. Mm -hmm. See, um, and, um, and people will do anything to get attention. Mm -hmm. See, and, um, tell me about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, but, but right now, our politics you could divide it into, divide it in half. Those who want to serve God and their fellow human beings, and those who want to be served and run everything. And um, that seems to be the way the Congress is going. I enjoyed my time in Congress. I wasn't there for four years, but I respected people and worked with people on both sides of the aisle. 
And um, <laughs> it, it was really one of the most fun times in my life because I'd get together with people who I didn't agree with in politics, but we got in a cloakroom back where they served the hot dogs and the Coca-Colas and things. Um, and folk would come from all over the country and they'd bring their dirty jokes with them. <laughs> and we'd get back there and we'd laugh and we'd talk about, I mean, we just, we just had fun. See, they, they don't do that now. They do not do that now. Do you think it they is? They don't speak it, to each other. Do you think it is in part because of term limits, not having term limits, that they're seeking a career rather than to serve the community? Well, no, I, I mean, I, th there is a political reason for it, but I think Well, Sid. No. <laughs> well, it, it's sin. It's sin. It's sin. All it's sin. men sin and fall short of the glory of God, and women do too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we, that's why the gospel is so powerful. See, because while we are yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. You, you talk about the power of the gospel and the stats say that America is seeing a decline in church attendance. Uh, not all of America, but certain segments of America and certain segments of denominations are seeing a decline. Others are seeing a steadiness or an increase. Uh, I partially think that we have changed the way we consume it, content, mm -hmm. that we stream now. We do a, a lot of things that it's not just about church attendance. But if there is, in fact, a decline from faith, would that explain the high ratio of suicides, depressions, and murders in this country? It will. Then yeah. what needs, what, what, what is the church doing that it should be doing better? to have a greater impact on the world. It seems well, to me... Not, let's just, let me just say that whatever I've done, my mother and my father used to get out on their knees by the side of the bed every night. And they prayed for us. And that wasn't enough for my mother because she had to pass the Catholic Church to get to work. And when me and my brother went off to college, she went in there every morning and got down on her knees and lit a candle, praying for me and my little brother, see? And the world is evil. And there is a constant battle between things that want to bring us together and things that want to tear us apart. And it's not just race, it's class, economies, it's color, it's uh, fat folk and skinny folk. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the human dilemma. I went, to, I went to church, you went to family. I, I think you went right down to the root of the whole thing. That if it doesn't start in the house, one week in the church, it's not gonna fix it. Well, the blessing, you know, the blessing of my life was that my grandmama lost her sight when she was about 85. And, uh, I had to come home from school every day and read the Bible and the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And um, that included telling her what the number was. <laughs> <laughs> See? And um, so I figured everything my grandmama did was right. And so when we organized the lottery in Georgia, I couldn't oppose it because my grandmama played it lovely. 
And so what we did was we said, okay, if y'all want to play the numbers, we're going to make it legal, but all of the profits of the numbers goes into the Hope Scholarship. And um, anybody in any school in Georgia that has a, a B average and can make a thousand on the SAT can go to any state college free. Right. Now, that gave us, we probably have a million college students in Georgia now because of the Hope Scholarship. And every school is more integrated than it was a few years back. That's getting people very anxious because you, you can't look at it. I mean, you, you can't find white folks playing basketball anymore. Right. And everything that we see now, if it's a level playing field and we have a fair chance, the poorer you are and the more you've had to struggle and the harder your life has been, the better you turn out. <laughs> see? And so it's, it's, um, it's not understanding really what makes life work, but it seems like God uses our weakness and our evil to put us into situations that force us to get strong. Boy, that's a sermon right there. That's the whole sermon right there. Play a game with me. Let, none of us know exactly what the afterlife is going to be like. We've read about it. We've heard about it. We know scriptures about it, but we don't know until we experience it. But let's play with our imaginations and say you walk through the pearly gates and you run right into Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King II, and, and he left here not quite 40, I think over 50 years has passed since he's been gone. How would you catch him up on how things happened after he left? I would thank him. I would thank him for not leaving us because there's nothing I have done in the 50, 60 years since he's been gone that I didn't catch from him. I maybe didn't learn it, see, but but I really have felt, in fact, I got put out of Sunday school uh, when I was about 10 years old because they told me about Elisha going to heaven on a flaming chariot. And I said, I don't believe that. <laughs> and, and they put me out of class. But I never forgot that. And then. I was on that balcony. <laughs> Are you trying to take my church from me? <laughs> no, but I was on that balcony with uh, Martin. I, well, I wasn't. I was down in the parking lot. And when I heard the shot, I ran up there, and I realized that the bullet had clipped off the tip of his chin and had severed his spinal cord. And it probably happened well, those particular bullets were faster than the speed of sound. So they cut his chin and severed his spinal cord so that he probably felt no pain. He probably didn't even hear a shot. And I sat there looking at the sky and realizing, you know, the Lord can take you to heaven in a flaming chariot. Wow. But Jesus also said, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. What was that feeling, running up those steps, hearing that shot, knowing, not knowing for sure 
what you were going to see and when you did see it. Take us inside your heart. What was that feeling? It was how are we going to carry on? We were not doing well with him. And um, I could see that it was going to be hard for us to stick together. But the night before he went to Memphis for the third time, the week before he got shot, we were in New York and he'd been preaching at the Saint jo Cathedral of St. John the Divine and he invited Harry Belafonte and John Conyers, congressman from Detroit, Dick Hatcher from mayor of Gary, and myself happened to be in his room. And the discussion was, how do we take the energy, the vitality, the faith and spirit of this movement into politics? And he said that you ought not have to get a thousand people to march because you need a red light on the corner. You're supposed to be able to pick up the phone and call your representative, your mayor, your congressman, your senator, whatever, and, and you're supposed to, you're, they're supposed to be your representative. And if politics works well and works right, Wonderful things can happen. And I, I don't know this brother, but I, I've seen his picture. Uh, was it Colin Red? Colin Allred. Yeah. And um, he really started impressing me because I, I just look at him over television. And, and then I learned that he, uh, he played football at Baylor. And that's a good Baptist school. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he went to law school. And then he came back here. And every time I've heard him talk, he, um, well, he just makes so much sense. And he's calm. He's cool. He, you know, and, and he, when I found out he played linebacker with the Chicago Bears, that means he's tough. Mm -hmm. See, and um, this country is evenly divided right now, with the Senate controlled by one group and the House controlled by another group, and, and, and nothing is happening. And this next election, one or two votes can make a big difference. And um, we. <laughs> We got out to vote when, the, when Georgia was not sure which way it was going. And it, I ended up running for Congress because that group around Harry Belafonte said that Martin said, somebody needs to run from Congress. We got to go into politics. And when it came to election day, it poured down rain. I said, Lord, why did you do this to me? <laughs> See, I know my people ain't going to come out in the rain <laughs> and get their hair messed up. <laughs> See, and I was wrong. They came. That 75% of the black community turned out and voted in a storm. Yeah. And I think I realized that that was people who needed some hope and that maybe through politics we could provide action. Um, it's hard. You, you are a preacher that turns your preaching into action. It's very hard to do that. Thank you. And, and yet, we found a way to do it in, in Atlanta. We, we found a way to get to Wall Street and get money to build the world's busiest airport. And, um, and it's no taxpayer money. And we brought the world's biggest Olympics to Atlanta. Uh, 
and put it on, paid for everything, and had $100 million left over. And um, politics can work. Um, and I always felt that it was the spirit of Martin Luther King and the faith and energy and trust of the Church of Jesus Christ and the Nation of Islam, because they went out and voted too. And white people who didn't know much about me kind of said, maybe we just take a chance with him for a little while. <laughs> and see how it works. But that's what changed Atlanta. When not, well, it has been so. And it also could have, because when I got elected, Jimmy Carter starts deciding he's going to be president. Yeah. And, and he was white, poor. But he went to the Naval Academy and was one of the most brilliant students there, even though he was a country bumpkin. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he knew the same Jesus I knew. Absolutely. When uh, John F. Kennedy was shot right in the city, right down the road from where we are, and yet we had unsettled business with Lyndon B. Johnson for Bill of Rights. Several civil rights leaders walk into the Oval Office with Lyndon B. Johnson to try to turn things around at a very volatile moment in our history. Walk me in that Oval Office. Is it tense? Is it tight? Is it amiable? What does it take? You talk about negotiating the airport, negotiating all this stuff, that's, and everybody claps. What does it take to negotiate a hard deal in a tough place? It really didn't take much. When Martin Luther King was talking to Lyndon Johnson, he wasn't talking like a civil rights leader. He was talking like a pastor. Mm. And we, we were supposed to see Lyndon Johnson at 4 o'clock. And at 7 o'clock, we still had not gotten in the, in the White House. We were across the street with Hubert Humphrey and the Attorney General, but they didn't want us to leave. And when we got there, we realized he was with all of the people who were pushing the war in Vietnam. And they were trying to get him to kill and destroy and add more troops and drop more bombs. And so when Martin got in there, President Johnson was really depressed. And we didn't make any arguments. He functioned as a pastor. And he listened to the president's troubles. And he didn't pray out loud. But when we left there, I said, he didn't have much. He doesn't have the power to do anything as the President of the United States. That he can't stop this war. He can't get a voting rights bill passed. He can't do any of the things we want him to do. You need to take a sabbatical. So it was December. And uh, I think it was the 16th of December. And he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and and he, he said, no, we got to pre get the president some power. We got to get the president some power. <laughs> now, what I didn't realize then was he was talking about spiritual power. I was talking about political and economic power. And two days after we got back, 
who shows up in his office but Amelia Boynton from Selma. Wow. And she says, my husband died and Jim Clark wouldn't even let him have the funeral in the church. They made, him, they made us bury him from the street. They put horses up in front of his own church and wouldn't let us go in because he was too political. And he said to Doc, she said to Dr. King, we need your help. He said, well, we'll be there right after Christmas. And we started in Selma on the 2nd of January, 1965, with nothing. He'd given away all the money for the Nobel Prize, um, saying that he was introducing Voting Rights Act bill. And he concluded his speech saying, and we shall overcome. Wow. All right. No money. <laughs> Not a lot of people. Uh, disagreements internally. <laughs> President has a personal problem. And yet none of that stopped you from getting where you were trying to go. Is anybody getting anything out of this? We are living in a society that says unless you have a, all kinds of money and all kinds of followers and all kinds of support and all kinds of votes, you can't get anything done. You all walked in there bickering amongst yourself <laughs> and still got the job done by the grace of God. What all those clips I saw of, of you as a young man and it's so funny because when people meet you older, they think you were born old. <laughs> so I keep, I keep pictures around to prove that I didn't start out like this. If you could go back and talk to that young boy from New Orleans, how would you prepare him for the life you led? I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a talk. When you look at all the things that happened from that young boy in New Orleans to there, and obviously he was prepared by parents and all of that, but having the advantage of having survived it all, what would you tell him that might have made it a little bit easier? I don't think anything. I mean, I. I well, when I left college, I had really screwed up in college because my daddy wanted me to be a dentist and I knew I wasn't going to be a dentist. Uh, and uh, my brother's a dentist though, but <laughs> on the way back from Howard, we stopped in North Carolina because it was, it was a segregated, I mean, we couldn't find a place to stay. There was no hotel that would let us stay between Washington and New Orleans. So we were staying at a, a, a school, Lincoln Academy in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. And I ran, I was on Howard's track team and I, I was frustrated. And when I get frustrated, I run. And I run too fast and I got too winded and dehydrated. But I was at the base of the mountain and I decided I was gonna push on to the top of the mountain. And I don't know what happened then, but I must have passed out or something for a little while. And when I woke up and I looked out, the world just looked different. I mean, the sky looked different, trees looked different, the cornfield looked m m brighter yellow, the cows looked like they were having fun, <laughs> you know, and, and, and um, it, it just, it hit me. 
everything I see got a purpose. Whoever made all this didn't make everything and everybody with a purpose but me. If there's a, if there's a purpose for trees and cows and the clouds, surely God didn't leave me with nothing. And that, and, and, but I, I came down from that mountain thinking there's something that I can do in this world that nobody else can do. And I don't know what it is. I take it one day at a time. And taking it one day at a time and doing the best I can and doing some things that nobody else wanted to do. <laughs> Nobody wanted to work with Martin Luther King. Folk around him were getting sued. They were taking their money. They were sh shooting at him. And uh, he'd been bombed and stabbed. And when, when they ca called me, I had a good job in New York. And um, they said that Martin Luther King, um, about the, and, um, about the same time, and um, about the same time, and my wife, who's from Marion, Alabama, uh, said, I'm going home. I said, you just bought, we just bought this house. We had a house in Queens, nice house. And um, I said, well, what you want me to do? She said, I don't know, but you need to find some place down south, quit this job, sell this house. And uh, she just had our third baby. And when you get settled, I'll be at my mama's house in Marion, Alabama. <laughs> find you something to do down south and call me and tell me what you're doing and I'll join you. See? And it, it almost worked out like that, that, that there was a foundation that wanted to give Martin some money. And there was no, uh, he didn't have any tax exempt status, see? And so I went to my church, United Church of Christ, and I said, can, we, they had all these schools in South, and I said, uh, can you take that money and revive, revitalize some of these schools and let us train people for voter registration and to read and write to register to vote. And they said, yes, and uh, if you go down as the administrator. And uh, I said, well, I wouldn't want to take any of their money. And he said, no, we'll pay you whatever the going rate is. Uh, and so I had a job, and they put me in an office right across the hall from Martin Luther King. And his secretary came over there with a, a egg crate full of mail. And I know you have problems with your mail, see? Because Martin would, I mean, he had letters stacked up like that. I mean, thousands of letters. And his secretary came over and said, look, you in Atlanta. You can't be in Atlanta as a single man. You will get in trouble. Uh, idle mind is the devil's workshop. Uh, would you mind helping Dr. King answer his mail? And I said, no, I'd be glad to try. And I started, you know, answering. The, I'd write it out. She'd type it up. and. He'd sign it, and he started reading what I wrote, and, and he said, how does he know what I'm trying to think? What I, what, how does he know what I want to say? And, and when he asked, I said, look, you know, you went to seminary, I went to seminary. You got a PhD, but I, I read some of the same books. <laughs> and, and I said, I, I, I kind of guess what you would want to say. And I was getting it right. So more and more, he started giving me more and more work to do that nobody else wanted to do. 
And the key to me was, what is it that nobody else wants to do? And if whatever nobody else wants to do, that's where I, what I made my job. <laughs> I hope you all are getting this. There, there, there are I mean, when I ran, when I ran for Congress, see, they'd killed Medgar Evers, they'd killed Malcolm X, they, they killed the president, they were killing people right and left. Yeah. And nobody wanted to run for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, "Well, nobody wants to run." And I said, "I don't either." He said, "Yeah, but Dr. King said that after he was gone." Well, he said the last meeting before he went to Memphis that we have to shift this movement into politics. So that was like, I was like a voice from beyond. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't say no to that. See? And it's, it's been that way. Um, I'm reminded of a great sermon I heard one time about a, and people were selling fish, and um, they couldn't get the fish from one coast to the other uh, until they put a catfish in there to ch chase the fish around, and it kept them active and bright. I mean, it. Uh, you heard that. You know that. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I I'm heard a, you preach I'm, that. I'm gonna pay you times for bringing up my message. Uh, <laughs> You, you, I want to go back to something. We're almost out of time, but I want to go back to something. You said the cows looked brighter, the, the, the corn was taller, the trees were brighter, the wind was blowing, and you had an epiphany that if God made everything else with purpose, he made you with purpose. I thought that was such a huge statement, and you said, there is something that I can do that nobody else can do. And, and, and sometimes in the process of listening at people speak, we enjoy the speaking, but we don't retain the substance. And I'm wondering how many people in this room live with a voice that says there's something that I can do that nobody else in the world can do. If you're one of them, stand up, stand up. Let me see you. Because I think that has a lot to do with your story, what you said to yourself. We talked about what your parents said. You talked about the influence of your church. You talked about your associations and all of that. But the, the, but the real nut of it all is what you said to yourself. There is something that I can do that nobody else can do. That was a big moment. You can be seated. That was a big moment. The other big moment was to do what nobody else will do. I, I think we're living in a day now that people only do what they have to do. If it's not on their job description, if it's not on their watch, if, if it's five o'clock, if, if their shift is over, if it's not on my parking space, I don't do it. But greatness comes when you, whatsoever your hands find to do, you do that with all your might. You've done that. You, you, you have done that for the world. You have done that. We were talking in the back. I was in South Africa. He was there. I'm in South Africa. He's sitting in a chair, and, and he's trying to get up to speak to me. And I'm trying to get down to speak to him. Because there are people who have done so much for the world that I don't care who you are, you ought to kneel. You ought to give respect. Respect for your elders has gone out of style, but I believe in respect for your elders. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time 
to fly all the way from Atlanta just to talk to us. I want, I want to thank you for getting your hands dirty. I want to thank you for getting your hands bloody. I want to thank you for loving Dr. King. I want to thank you for the role that you played in history. Uh, I want to thank you for the things that you have done to try to bring peace to the Middle East. I want to thank you for what you have done for Atlanta. I want to thank you for what you have done for black people. I want to thank you for what you have done for all people. We salute you, Ambassador Andrew Young. You are absolutely amazing. Let's give it up for him. I'm so proud, so proud. One more time, make some real noise.